I had a sudden epiphany, reminiscent of those comedic moments in cartoons where a light bulb materializes above a character's head upon realizing something significant. It dawned on me that my third child wasn't biologically mine, rather, she belonged to another man. I found myself on the phone with a representative from GenealogyGurus.com, attempting to resolve the mystery of why my daughter's DNA test hadn't been processed even after 10 weeks. Originally given to her as an extra Christmas present, I provided the representative with the necessary tracking numbers. After a brief wait, he returned to the line, confirming that the test had indeed been processed. However, due to confidentiality protocols, he couldn't divulge any further details regarding the results. I asked, if you processed it, why doesn't it show up on my DNA results? I was quite excited when I asked this. The representative replied somewhat irritably, Sir, there are several reasons why your daughter may not appear in your DNA matches, but I can't discuss this specific test with you. That's when it hit me like a light bulb going off in my head. The number one reason she doesn't show up in my matches is because she's not biologically related to me. I ended the call in a daze. I remember pressing the red end call button and then breaking down in tears. I woke up a few minutes later, curled up on the couch in the family room. I still had 15 minutes left before my lunch break, so I decided to call my daughter, who was probably on her lunch break as well, since we both worked in the same time zone. I knew she usually enjoyed lunch while reading a book at her desk, so I wasn't concerned about bothering her. She picked up the phone after the first ring and greeted me with a somewhat weary tone. Hi daddy, how are you? I responded, sweetheart, you know I love and trust you completely, but I found out about the DNA test. I called the genealogy company, and they told me it was processed about two weeks ago. There was a moment of silence, and I could hear her taking a deep breath on the other end of the line. I know, Dad. We need to talk, but I can't do it here and now. Call me tonight, and please make sure Mom isn't in the room when you do. I felt like a blur as I drove back to the office, and I have to admit that I didn't have a very productive afternoon at the engineering firm where I worked. My mind was in turmoil with countless thoughts and questions, especially the unsettling idea that my beloved daughter might not really be my own. Being naturally analytical, I realized I needed to sort things out and deal with each issue methodically. After all, I held the position of VP of Engineering for a reason, and I understood that treating personal problems as if they were project challenges was the way to go. The old man, Duane, had instilled this approach in me when he hired me straight out of university to work for his then burgeoning company. With Duane as our leader and me right by his side, his company grew into an industry powerhouse, and we both enjoyed significant financial success. I had a great income, excellent benefits, and I collaborated with smart, witty colleagues. Plus, when I returned home each evening, a beautiful, alluring wife and three wonderful children awaited me. Over time, the kids grew up, left the nest, got married, and started families of their own. Initially, the house felt a bit lonely, but we found ways to stay occupied, and I believe that the solitude rejuvenated our relationship as a couple. However, as I reflected on the events of the past month, I couldn't help but recall a few peculiar incidents, including Marissa's phone call to my wife about two weeks ago. One Tuesday night while we were both in the family room watching TV, Tracy's phone rang. She glanced at the screen and informed me it was Marissa, then proceeded to answer the call. Their conversation lasted about five minutes, during which Tracy responded with mostly yes and no. I noticed tears forming in the corners of her eyes when she hung up. I asked if everything was alright, and she explained that Marissa's cat had some health issues. She downplayed it as no big deal, although I sensed a hint of unease in her demeanor. It struck me as peculiar how personally she seemed to be taking Marissa's cat's health problems. Little did I know that might have been the moment when Marissa discovered the truth. Tracy had no knowledge of the DNA test I had secretly sent to Marissa. I hadn't considered it significant enough to mention. Marissa was the only one among our three kids who showed any interest in genealogy, so I thought she'd embrace the idea. I'd been researching my family's ancestry for years, and I particularly enjoyed the DNA testing aspect. I assumed Marissa would eagerly take the test. Clearly, I had been mistaken. When I returned home, I made a conscious effort not to treat Tracy any differently, even though I was simmering with inner turmoil. I kept repeating to myself, work on one problem at a time. I had met Tracy during my sophomore year at university. We didn't cross paths until my senior year, but ever since then, it felt like we were joined at the hip, at least from my perspective. We tied the knot a year after graduating from college, a solid 31 years ago to this very day. 
I'd proudly proclaim that it was the best decision I ever made. At 54, she still carries her beauty gracefully, and despite giving birth to three kids, she maintains a workout routine that keeps her looking like she's in her 30s. She's a bundle of fun and humor, and until today, I eagerly anticipated spending the rest of my life with her. Around 8 o'clock, I informed Tracy that I needed to make a call to the old man regarding a project we were collaborating on, and I excused myself from the room. In actuality, I grabbed my jacket and headed out to the porch swing where I could have a conversation without worrying about Tracy overhearing that. When I dialed Marissa's number, Marissa picked up on the very first ring, and her voice carried unmistakable distress. I'm sorry, Dad. I know I should have told you earlier, but Mom asked me to keep quiet until she had a chance to talk to you, she whispered before I could even say hello. Hey, I'm not angry with you. Take a deep breath, I replied, doing my best to comfort her. I'm not pointing fingers at you, you're just as much a victim in this mess as I am. I could hear her ragged breathing on the other end. I knew how much it was tearing her apart. I want you to understand that this changes nothing between us. I'm still your dad, and you'll always be my pumpkin. I've poured all my love into you kids all these years, and I'm not about to stop now unless that's what you want. At this point, she broke down completely, and her sobs rendered her almost unintelligible over the phone. I love you, daddy. I don't need anyone else but you, she said through tears. I cautiously told my daughter that I didn't want to put her on the spot, but she was my best source for DNA information. I assured her that we wouldn't delve into other matters so she wouldn't get caught in the middle, but I needed to know if she had any DNA matches. She sighed and confirmed that Amanda Anderson turned out to be her half-sister. I was astounded and asked if she meant Amanda, Uncle George, and Aunt Jenny's daughter. She softly replied affirmatively. I reassured her that it was not her fault and she never had to apologize to me ever. This revelation meant that George Anderson, who my kids knew as Uncle George and the rest of the world recognized as appeals court Judge George Anderson, was Marissa's biological father. Damn. This also implied that my wife had been involved with her boss when he was an attorney at the law firm. This meant it must have happened at least 25 years ago, considering Marissa is 24 years old now. At that time, Tracy used to work as his administrator. George left the law firm to become a state judge a few years later, eventually moving to the state capitol where his career really took off. Tracy, on the other hand, didn't pursue a romantic relationship with George, she stayed at the law firm and eventually became the office manager. However, during the few years they worked together, George and his wife, Jenny, became such close friends with us that our children still refer to them as uncle and auntie, and their kids call me and Tracy the same. On a few occasions when I was away on business trips, Tracy and the kids would spend a few days at George and Jenny's lake house. It never really raised any suspicion in my mind, and the kids even talked about Aunt Jenny taking them places without me or Tracy. I must have missed some important details. I was deep in my thoughts when I heard Marissa calling out to me. I apologized to my daughter, telling her I got lost in thought, and thanked her for her help, asking her to say hi to Drew, her husband, for me. Marissa then asked me what I was planning to do. I admitted to her that I wasn't entirely sure, to which she advised me not to do anything incredibly stupid. She said a little foolishness was okay but warned me against doing anything that might get me arrested. I hadn't entertained thoughts of harming Tracy until that moment, but I had promised Marissa that I wouldn't get myself arrested, so I guess that ruled out any thoughts of violence. I never break promises to my kids. Ever. My top priority was to calm Marissa down about our relationship, and then I needed to find out who Tracy's partner in crime was. The third task on my list was to initiate divorce proceedings, but I'd have to find a new lawyer because my current one is affiliated with the firm where Tracy works, which was definitely a no-go. After meeting with a lawyer and getting things in order, I would then have to deal with soon-to-be ex-Mrs. Clark Walters. The house felt chilly and empty when Tracy and I were together. She could talk non-stop, probably due to nerves, I suppose. She really put an effort to keep me content, probably thinking it would soften the blow when I eventually found out the truth. It's hard to say for sure, but there was definitely a growing distance between us, and she wasn't making any effort to bridge it. Around a week later, I consulted with one attorney. As soon as he learned that my wife was the office manager at GUI, his expression turned anxious, so I moved on to the next lawyer on my list, a young woman in her 20s who simply smiled when I mentioned Tracy's position at GUI. This was the type of attorney I needed, someone who wouldn't be intimidated if one of the high-profile GUI attorneys acted as my wife's representative. 
I shared what little I knew about the infidelity situation, starting with the revelation that my youngest child wasn't biologically mine and was, in fact, George Anderson's child. Court of Appeals, George Anderson, my attorney, Marie Robinette, asked the same. I replied, closely observing her reaction to see if I should consider finding another lawyer. It must be quite a story, she remarked, and we delved into the financial aspects. Given our solid jobs, pensions, and benefits, Marie suggested splitting joint assets equally, retaining a share in our pensions, and selling the house. This would leave both of us financially comfortable, though I'd have a slightly better position due to higher income and a better pension. Marie added that unless I was dead set on seeking revenge over my spouse's infidelity, the child, or just a lack of respect, we could have our reckoning for sure, however. I replied that I didn't want to help her financially, despite feeling wronged. Marie then inquired about pursuing legal action against the judge involved, noting that it would be much more complicated and time-consuming. I retorted, perhaps a bit harshly, that the judge was my concern and I would handle it my way. Marie understood and suggested that if my spouse didn't contest, the issue could be resolved in six months, but if she did, it might take more than a year. I told her that I hadn't set any deadlines yet, so she should take her time and do it right. With the third task completed, it was time to move on to the fourth, the confrontation. I waited another week just to see if Tracy's conscience would get the best of her. During that time, Saturday night was our usual date night, followed by watching a movie and sharing an intimate moment. However, Saturday night was always a particularly special occasion for us. We hadn't been out on a date in two weeks, and it had been just as long since we'd been intimate. After finding out about Marissa's affair, I couldn't bring myself to go through with it. Tracy didn't question it, which was another sign that she knew I was aware, but she was quite skilled at putting on a facade. However, that was about to change. I decided to take her to a fancy French restaurant where we enjoyed a bottle of wine and indulged in some delicious desserts. She seemed happier than she had in weeks. Upon returning home, I carefully helped her out of her coat, guided her to the kitchen table, pulled out a chair for her, and uttered those famous words, We need to talk. Tracy offered a half-smile as I poured myself a Jack Daniels on the rocks and offered her a drink from the liquor cabinet, which she gracefully declined. Placing my drink on the table, I locked eyes with her and said, The floor is yours. Tracy reminded me that it had been a long time since she and George were together, about twenty years, and asked if we could consider it a mistake from the distant past and move on. I was relieved that she didn't dispute the DNA test's accuracy, but her attempt to brush it off as ancient history seemed dismissive. I pressed for details, asking about the timeline and frequency of her affair with George and whether our first two children, Barry and Kathy, were also his. Tracy clarified that Barry and Kathy were mine and that her involvement with George started about a year after Kathy was born, lasting around three years. She explained that it ended when George left the firm to pursue a judicial career, ensuring his background check was clean. After their breakup, they only had a few encounters at the lake house when Jenny took the kids out, with Jenny being initially oblivious but later learning the truth. Tracy mentioned a reconciliation meeting where she and George promised Jenny there would be no more intimacy. Frustrated, I asked Tracy why she never tried to have a peaceful discussion with me and if I was just a spare part to her, she replied, wiping her hands on her sleeves, that she knew she could never tell me, as I would have filed for divorce immediately. Claiming she loved me then and still does, I couldn't help but remark on her apparent love for George Moore, noting that she started and stopped with him at his command, seemingly considering me only as a backup plan. Tracy protested desperately, insisting that she loved me with all her heart. In response, I accused her of having loved George with all her heart, sacrificing their relationship for his career dreams while knowing I was her fallback option. I pointed out that while she might have had some love for me, she was aware of how much I idolized her and relied on her family to cope with his absence. Tracy's gaze falling to her knees seemed to confirm this painful truth. Regarding Marissa, Tracy confessed that during her affair with George, she hadn't considered the consequences until the DNA test I sent revealed the truth. She assumed that since both she and George had brown hair, brown eyes, and fair skin, no one would suspect Marissa's paternity. She figured I wouldn't question it, especially since Marissa ended up resembling her, not knowing for sure until the DNA test. I exclaimed in disbelief, questioning if she was implying it was my fault. Tracy explained that she and George discussed the possibility of Marissa's paternity, but she reassured him not to worry due to his resemblance to me. She mentioned that George might not have known either but probably knew by now, 
and that she hadn't heard from him since Marissa and Drew's wedding two years ago. Tracy emphasized that regardless of who knew what, Marissa was still hers, insisting that she was listed on the birth certificate, raised her, loved her, and considered her her own. She sternly stated that George had better not even think about claiming otherwise, and that if he contacted me, I should make that clear to him. I asserted my intention to have the other two children undergo DNA testing as soon as possible, explaining that I needed to know for my own peace of mind. Tracy pleaded with me, insisting that I already knew they were mine and questioning why I couldn't trust her. I shot back, my newfound distrust evident, which seemed to take Tracy completely by surprise. She was also deeply troubled by the thought of me revealing her infidelity to our other two children, understandably not wanting to appear unfaithful in front of them. Changing the subject, I inquired about the details of her affair, asking how often it happened and where else they met. Tracy began to explain that their relationship wasn't planned but developed from spending time together at work, becoming friends, and then something more. She described him as kind, considerate, witty, funny, and passionate, and mentioned they had a deep connection because they both had spouses they loved. They kept their meetings discreet, usually out of town, and never met at either of our houses, as that would have been wrong on many levels. Tracy whispered to me that they hadn't been intimate since their affair ended. When I asked if Jenny knew about all of this and had forgiven them, she confirmed, reiterating that she had told me before. I whispered, my voice tinged with uncertainty, that I didn't think I could go back to how things were. Tracy tried to reassure me, acknowledging the wrongness of their actions but emphasizing that it had been over for twenty years, and I hadn't had to endure it while it was happening. She pleaded for us to return to our lives from a few weeks ago, where I was her loving husband and she, my loving wife, insisting that nothing had to change. Firmly, I told Tracy that things had already changed. I shared that I had spent the better part of three weeks wondering what I had done wrong for her to fall in love with another man, and I had been questioning whether I could ever fully trust her again, let alone enough to stay married. I expressed, with heavy emotion, that I had given her my heart completely, yet she treated it as something to be taken out only when it suited her. I stressed that our marriage wasn't supposed to be one of convenience but rather a commitment of unwavering love. At this point, Tracy began to cry. Typically, I would try to console her, but this time felt different. I retreated to the family room, turned on the TV, and left her alone at the kitchen table. That night, we shared the same bed, but for the first time in a while, we didn't cuddle. I moved as far away from her as I could on the double bed and didn't let her snuggle up to me when she climbed in. Her face showed a mix of surprise and pain, but I didn't really care. On Sunday morning, as Tracy prepared a nice breakfast and we were eating, I broached the topic of divorce. She practically yelled at me, arguing that the affair happened over twenty years ago and that I hadn't even known about it, urging that it was in the past and we should just move forward. In response, I shouted back, emphasizing that a mistake remains a mistake regardless of how long ago it occurred. I expressed my feelings of betrayal, highlighting how she deceived me, lied to me, and cheated on me, thereby violating my trust. I pointed out these weren't temporary problems. Unable to continue the conversation, I got up from the table, leaving half my plate of food behind, and headed outside to mow the lawn. That was the last conversation I had with Tracy until Wednesday afternoon when she informed me that Jenny Anderson would be joining us next weekend. Needless to say, I wasn't thrilled, but Jenny was an old and dear friend who had gone through the same cheating ordeal as I had, so I thought it was worth having a chat with her. On Friday night at 6 o'clock, Jenny showed up, having traveled two hours from her house. Surprisingly, she didn't bring George with her. During dinner, our conversation remained light and friendly, and afterward, we moved to the family room with glasses of wine, presumably to delve into the main event. Jenny began discussing the affair as if it were a distant historical topic, speaking calmly and dispassionately. However, as she continued, her emotions intensified, and tears welled up in both hers and Tracy's eyes. Jenny shared that when George told her about the affair, she had assumed it had ended years ago and he had assured her it wouldn't happen again. She admitted that she was devastated at first, but after giving it more thought, she came to realize that since it was over before she even knew about it, she guessed she wasn't hurt too badly. Knowing that Jenny wasn't some gold digger, I could see how it all unfolded. George's personality is quite captivating, isn't it? Although I only found out about Marissa a few weeks ago when everyone else did, I understand. I'm genuinely sorry about that, Clark. Jenny never brought up the few times Tracy and George met after their initial affair, particularly at the Anderson's Lake House. I wondered if they had informed her about those occasions. 
but I didn't bother to ask. It did make me wonder, though, if George must be an excellent lawyer because Jenny seemed to be almost apologizing for his affair rather than being upset with him. Unfortunately for Tracy, I'm not as settled as Jenny, and I'm not as enthralled by her eloquence, so I wasn't inclined to give Tracy and George a pass like Jenny did. Even though their romance had spanned two decades, I often contemplate what my life would be like if I left him and how it would affect me and the girls. Jenny continued, they say you should always weigh whether your life would improve or worsen without your spouse. In my case, I believe it would be worse. Thank you for sharing your perspective with me, Jenny. It's definitely something to think about, and I'll need to carefully consider it. There are several factors at play, including the fact that, unlike you, I wasn't informed about the affair, I stumbled upon it entirely by accident. Tracy knew it was wrong when she was involved with George and anticipated my reaction. She believed it would be better for everyone if I never found out and just lived in ignorance. That would have been the case if it weren't for the DNA test. Now, 20 years later, I've discovered that the love of my life had an intimate relationship with another man before reverting back to me. During Jenny's story, Tracy remained silent, merely listening as Jenny shared her narrative. Tracy couldn't have known that I was aware of her glances in my direction, so I sat casually while Jenny spoke, just to mildly annoy Tracy. My response to Jenny's story wasn't what Tracy had hoped for, and neither was Jenny's. They exchanged sorrowful glances, realizing that I wasn't reacting the way they had anticipated. I shook my head, went to the kitchen, poured myself another glass of wine, returned to the family room, and turned on the big screen. It was a clear signal that our conversation for the day was done. The ladies got the hint and moved to the living room, where I could faintly hear them chatting. After finishing whatever I was watching, I switched off the TV, stuck my head into the living room, bid them good night, and headed upstairs to our bedroom. Jenny cornered me in the family room on Saturday, saying we needed to talk. I didn't know where Tracy was, but I agreed, and we relocated to the formal living room, settling into chairs in the corner. Jenny began by expressing understanding of my pain but argued that not forgiving Tracy and divorcing her would be a big mistake for both of us. She emphasized that our love for each other should be what matters most and that the past is history. She pointed out the tragedy it would be for us to spend the rest of our lives apart over something that happened 20 years ago, mentioning that if she could forgive George, I could surely forgive Tracy too. I replied honestly to Jenny, saying that I didn't know if I could forgive Tracy. I reminded her that unlike her situation where she was told about the affair, Tracy never told me. I argued that Tracy knew it was wrong, and that I wouldn't have forgiven her back then. So, I questioned why I should forgive her now. I emphasized the weight of her deception, she not only cheated on me for a few years, but also continued to deceive me for two more decades. I expressed my struggle with the idea of forgiving Tracy and questioned how I could ever trust her again. I shook my head, stood up, and walked out of the room, passing Tracy in the hallway. She could see from my expression that I wasn't budging an inch. Dinner on Saturday night was noisier than usual. The women attempted small talk, but I wasn't interested. I barely said three words throughout the meal. After a brief thank you, I grabbed my jacket and left, informing them that I'd be at Malone's, my preferred spot for a quiet drink. At Malone's, I felt down and chose a table over my usual bar spot. The bar owner, like a sister to me, urged me to open up. I shared that my wife, Tracy, cheated and our youngest might not be mine. She was outraged and supported me, offering her blunt perspective. I valued her honesty. She questioned if Tracy apologized for the affair or just for getting caught. I realized Tracy hadn't really apologized. The bar owner offered me free drinks and arranged a cab, taking my keys for safety. The cab dropped me off at home around two in the morning. Tracy greeted me at the door and helped me up to our bedroom. I collapsed into bed fully clothed, and Tracy took off my shoes and socks. That's how I slept. Late on Wednesday night, my son called me at the office. He wanted to discuss Tracy's situation with me. He didn't explicitly say it, but it seemed that Tracy had decided to involve the kids to sway me away from the divorce. My son and I typically saw eye to eye on most matters, but from our conversation, it became apparent that Tracy had put in significant effort, and it had paid off, as he clearly empathized with her side of the divorce dilemma. I had to explain to him. Firmly. I said that what she did initially could be seen as a mistake, but after continuing for months, it became a choice. I asked him how he'd feel if he found out his wife, Linda, was cheating. While the affair ended years ago, the deceit and disrespect didn't. 
I felt Barry should have stayed out of our parents' issues. He was taking sides and getting in the middle of something he shouldn't. I was frustrated, feeling betrayed after idolizing my wife, only to find out she kept a secret. If not for a certain accident, I'd still be in the dark. It felt like she used me as a backup plan. As Barry tried to argue that I was overreacting, I hung up, feeling that the conversation wasn't going anywhere. When I got home around 6 o'clock in the evening, Tracy was already busy preparing a delicious meal. She didn't look pleased when I mentioned I wasn't hungry. I poured myself a glass of Jack, turned on the TV, and settled into my favorite chair. She came in and asked what was wrong. Same old stuff, different day. My wife cheats on me for four years, has a kid with another guy, and now my kids are making me out to be the bad guy here. Do me a favor, call Kathy tonight and tell her not to call me tomorrow unless she wants to be hung up on like Barry. Tracy lowered her eyes. You'd think after 31 years, she'd know not to provoke me on her behalf. What makes you think the divorce won't happen? I said, raising my voice. Not only did you cheat on me for four years and have a child with another man, but you also replaced me in your heart with him. You can sit here and tell me that you weren't in love with him and that if he had asked you to divorce me and marry him, you wouldn't have done it. The truth is, you may love me, but you're not in love with me, you're in love with him. I'm just a dependable backup because you've always known my heart belongs to you, and I'd do anything to keep you as mine. You cheated on me, lied to me, disrespected me, and now you have the nerve to try to turn our children against me. That was the final straw, Tracy. But I won't be vengeful towards you, especially not to Jenny, and I won't destroy George's promising career as an upstanding judge. I'm going to file for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences, and we can each keep our retirement accounts while splitting everything else, including the house, right down the middle. As tears streamed down Tracy's cheeks and she got up from her chair, I couldn't help but add another jab, you never mentioned regretting your affair, probably because you don't regret it. The only thing you regret is that I found out. The rest of the night was spent in the company of a bottle of Jack Daniels. The following day, I got in touch with my attorney and told her to prepare the divorce papers as quickly as possible. She mentioned that I could review them the coming Tuesday and they'd be ready for Wednesday. Tracy could be served on Thursday, but I insisted that her process server come to my house on Friday night. I wanted to be present when she received the papers. Next, I made a call to Judge George Anderson's office, letting his receptionist know that I needed him to return my call regarding an important matter. He understood the reason for my call, and I was sure he'd call back promptly. When George did call back a couple of hours later, he seemed a bit uneasy. He knew precisely what I was getting at but preferred not to handle it at his office. I readily agreed and told him I'd be at his house the following Saturday at 10 a.m. He didn't know yet that Tracy would be served the night before, although I was certain he'd find out by the time I made the two-hour drive to his upscale residence. During dinner at Malone's on Saturday night, Tracy mentioned that Jenny had called her apprising her of my upcoming meeting with George the following Saturday. Tracy wanted to know if I'd like her to accompany me. I pointed out that this wasn't just casual conversation, George and I had serious matters to discuss, and her presence wasn't necessary. I reminded her that he was an appellate court judge with a sterling reputation, possibly in contention for a Supreme Court judgeship. Any confrontational behavior could lead to legal consequences. Besides, she had promised not to do anything detrimental to his career. Tracy retorted with a hint of jealousy, but I reassured her that I intended to keep my promise and not jeopardize George's career prospects. After confiding in the senior gentleman at the office about my situation, I took a few personal hours to meet with my attorney and review the divorce papers. I gave her the green light. As I was about to leave, she inquired if I had any plans concerning Judge George. Puzzled, I asked why she was concerned. She replied because I still handle some criminal cases, and I thought you might need a good lawyer. You engineers may not get too emotional about many things, but your methodical approach can be intimidating. She handed me her business card, and I exited her office. The next three days went by in a flash. We had a major project underway at the office, which gave me a chance to divert my attention away from my personal life. Even the old man in the office remarked on my remarkable focus despite the turmoil I was going through. I replied, telling him that it was a relief that at least one thing was going smoothly. However, on Friday evening before I left, I confided in him about Tracy being served with a lawsuit and my impending meeting with George. I warned him that if things went awry, I might end up in jail by Monday. He assured me of his support and pledged to provide bail money if needed. 
we parted ways with a firm handshake. Returning home, I was greeted by the enticing aroma of yet another delicious meal that Tracy was preparing. Lately, she had been going out of her way to showcase her culinary talents, and I had to admit she was an excellent cook. Despite the strained atmosphere that had characterized our meals for the past few weeks, I made sure to express my gratitude for the wonderful dinner. After all, I wasn't about to be ungrateful. Following dinner, as we were about to head to the family room for some television time, the doorbell rang. It was nearly seven o'clock, and I had a hunch it wasn't for me, so I stayed put. Tracy, on the other hand, flashed me a quick glance and went to answer the door. She opened it to find a well-dressed young man who inquired if she was Tracy Walters. Confirming her identity, she received a manila envelope from him, and with a brief statement, he said, you have been served, then swiftly walked away. Tracy remained motionless in her seat, but the slump in her shoulders and the tears welling up in her eyes spoke volumes. I walked past her, closed the front door, then gently guided her to the kitchen table. She looked utterly shaken, exactly as I had predicted. We sat there in silence for what felt like an eternity, although only five minutes had passed. Finally, she muttered, you a-hole, and fled upstairs to our bedroom. I chose not to follow her. The most challenging part was behind me now. For one of the rare occasions since our marriage, I didn't sleep in the same bed as Tracy that night. Instead, I retired to the guest bedroom we had set up. Although describing it as sleep would be a stretch, the woman I had considered the love of my life, my soulmate, my everything until a few weeks ago, was still sharing a bed with me despite everything that had transpired. I suppose neither of us wanted to be the first to make a move, but now in my mind at least, it was all over. The following morning, I got up, took a shower, and dressed quietly, careful not to disturb Tracy or provoke any confrontation. I didn't bother checking if she was asleep, I just collected my things and left. My attire was my usual combination, a collared shirt, a decent pair of Levi's jeans, and the custom-made cowboy boots with metal tips that I had acquired during a visit to our son in Dallas. I left a bit earlier than necessary. I wanted to make sure. I wasn't late for the meeting, if I arrived early, I could pass the time at the cafe, which is exactly what I did. I arrived at George and Jenny's house at exactly 10 o'clock and rang the doorbell. Jenny, always looking lovely though clearly nervous, opened the door. All I could manage to say was, I'm sorry it had to end like this. As she leaned in for a hug, she didn't respond with words, but she did take my hand and led me into the room where George had arranged his memorabilia and pictures all around. George was seated in his favorite chair, but as we walked in, he got up and stood in front of it. Hey, Clark. Hey. George, I said. Jenny, looking quite apprehensive, left the room. We stood about six feet apart, sizing each other up. There was a time when I considered this man almost like an older brother, that's how close we were. George was two years my senior, roughly the same height, but the comforts of the past twenty years had added about thirty pounds, with most of it settling in his round belly. We had shared our hopes and dreams, had countless adventures together, gone fishing and hunting side by side. I used to be proud to call him my friend and was equally proud of how far he had come in his career as a judge. But now, standing before me, his gaze no longer that of a friend but an enemy, I felt a surge of anger. You've got my wife's heart, you a-hole. I yelled at him. You also get to keep your squeaky clean image because I promised Tracy I wouldn't tell anyone about this, and I don't break promises to that woman. But you won't keep your manhood with that. I took a big step forward, with my left foot planted my right foot, and delivered a powerful upward kick aiming straight for his groin. George's reaction was slower than I expected, and my metal-tipped boot struck its target accurately and precisely. I could feel his pain as I kicked, and then I heard him howl in agony as he crumpled to the floor, clutching his injured area and crying out like a wounded animal. In that moment, all the rage and frustration boiled over. Jenny rushed into the room, seeing her husband writhing in pain on the floor, she tried to comfort him, but his screams only grew louder. She looked at me with fear in her eyes. I reached for my cell phone, dialed 911, and calmly said, there's been an accident at Judge George Anderson's house. We need an ambulance. I turned to leave, but just as I reached the door, Jenny grabbed my arm. I thought I might have to defend myself, but instead of panic or anger, there was a strangely calm expression on her face. She hugged me tightly and whispered, thank you. We're clear on what needs to be done. 
I hugged her, left the house, got in my car, and drove home, confident that the police wouldn't be coming after me. Jenny understood, and she'd explain it to her husband when he could think straight. Down the road, the drive home brought a mix of relief and maybe a gut punch. Who knows? After months of daily heartbreak, I finally felt unburdened. It's funny how realizing Tracy's betrayal actually loosened her grip on my heart, allowing me to think clearly and do what was best for me. It might not have been the right choice for everyone, but sometimes you've got to prioritize your own well-being. That's what everyone else had done for the past two decades, so why shouldn't I? I'm sure a part of me would always love Tracy, but I wasn't going to dwell on this chapter any longer. It wasn't my fault, and it wasn't my choice, it was time to move forward. Once I got home, I headed to the basement, grabbed a couple of suitcases, and made my way to our bedroom. Tracy followed me from the family room, asking, that's it then? That's it? I replied, 31 years and out the door, Tracy. It's a shame you're so wrapped up in yourself that you can't see how you deceived me, how you stole 24 years of my love through your deception. But I've moved past it, and I don't hate you. I don't even hate George, though that poor guy probably thinks I do now. I'll mend things with Barry and Kathy down the road. You should patch things up with Marissa as soon as you can, those girls are missing out. Sign the papers, Tracy, and let's put this behind us. I continued, I'll have the rest of my things out of here in the next few days. We don't need to talk anymore. If you have anything to say to me, I left my lawyer's business card on the kitchen table. She stood there in shock, tears welling up, but no words came. I grabbed my suitcases, went back downstairs, and stashed them in the trunk of my car. After returning to the house, I packed up my belongings and departed. Thirty-one years, just like that. The end. I lied. As it turns out, George managed to save one of his testicles after all. It required extensive surgery and months of pain, but they succeeded in saving one. I learned about it from Marissa, who had been contacted by Jenny trying to reach me. Jenny didn't have my phone number, and the rest of the family had no interest in informing me. In fact, they haven't spoken to me for eight months now, but I've come to terms with it. According to the official version, Judge George had a mishap in his office, falling onto the corner of his fancy desk and had a rough landing, twice ending up on the floor. The media played it down, calling it a domestic accident, sparing the details of the injury to his sensitive area. Surprisingly, he received a lot of sympathetic coverage. I guess even this won't hinder his chances of making it onto the Supreme Court shortlist. Tracy signed the divorce papers in just a week, and last week the divorce was officially finalized. The house will be auctioned off. Tracy hasn't attempted to reach out to me since I left, and neither have Barry or Kathy. It seemed like I wouldn't be joining the family Christmas dinner, wherever they decided to have it. The old man is passing the company reins to me come the new year as he heads into retirement. According to the agreement, I'll need to manage the company for seven years before I can comfortably retire with a significant golden parachute. Following that, there's a plan to seek a buyer for the company, and I'll receive a 10% share of that transaction as well. I've recently started socializing and dating again after what felt like an eternity of marriage. Relearning the ropes will undoubtedly take some time. Interestingly, news of my divorce spread rapidly, and several divorced acquaintances have reached out with interest. Even a few of Tracy's divorced friends contacted me, surprised she let me go at all. I must admit, it's been a pleasant ego boost. I envision a promising future ahead, brimming with both professional and personal challenges. In my leisure time away from work, I'm delving into new hobbies. One pursuit I've abandoned is genealogy, while it once intrigued me, it's no longer a focus of mine.